Red. Oh. All right. Remember that we have a half an hour or so at about 6.50. We need to press pause. We need to stop, take a clean break, press pause, and we'll start again. Okay, 6.50, 6.52. Okay. So the first thing that we're going to talk about tonight is scene safety. We spent a little bit of time talking about it on Tuesday night, but we're going to kind of try and dig down into scene safety a little bit deeper. Oh, I guess I need to erase that first. Um, what do you guys know about scene safety? You should continually be looking for it. You should continually be monitoring your scene so that you can make sure that it's always safe, right? So remember what our first priority on scene is? Yeah, rescuer safety first. Okay, rescuer safety first. If you were to pull up to, you guys do car accidents on the freeway, not you, sorry. These guys are all from uh, Orchard Combat Training Center. Oh. So they're all here from there. There's another student, my daughter, She's not here tonight, she's playing a double shift, but my daughter isn't from any fire service or anything like that, so. Uh, but you guys do a lot of responses to the freeway for accidents. A lot might be overstating it. You do some, okay? When you are driving to your call on the freeway, what are some of the things that are running through your head about the scene that you're going to? Uh, where you're gonna park. Okay, parking. Why is parking important? Uh, you have to be close to the incident, but far away in the same sense. You don't want to be too close that something bad could happen to you. Say if the car's on fire or something else, it could have, something bad could happen there. But then uh, passerbys could also hit you. Uh, you have to make sure you're out of traffic, but you also possibly have to block traffic if it's necessary for you to protect yourself in the scene. Okay, blocking traffic is an important reason as to why parking is so important. Okay, we do need to be uphill and upwind if we can help it, right? We don't want to be downhill and downwind. We don't want that crap flowing down to us. But we also need to be aware that where we park our vehicle will help, it will either help to protect us or it may cause us harm. So as we're pulling up, we need to think about where we're parking our vehicle. What else do we think about on our way to that scene? Weather. The weather. Why are we thinking about weather? Is it icy? Is it raining? Is it uh, foggy? Limited visibility? Okay. Why does any of that matter? That's how well the uh, passerbys can see us. How well the passerbys can see you. So again, it leads to your, your safety, right? Why does it matter to patient care? Um, if it's super hard, like dark to see, uh, it may, you may not find a patient right away. You may okay. have a hard time finding them or the accident itself if it's really okay. foggy or dark. Carrying a patient on an icy road Carrying is a, a lot of fun. <laughs> We've been down into rocks and all kinds of things. So that would be local conditions. Yep. So one, this one time, I we had been out on a hay fire, and it started to rain, and somehow in between, between all it starting to rain and stuff, we got the fire under control, left an engine there, headed back to the station, and on our way back to the station, we got called out to a car accident. And we got out to the car accident, and it was pouring down rain. Okay, and we were pulling the patient out on a backboard, and I was kind of trying to take care of the patient at the same time, and I had four firefighters around me, and they were holding the corners of a tarp because it was pouring down rain, and we were trying to protect the patient. They were doing a great job protecting the patient from the rain, but one of them let his, his corner slip, and it dumped water straight down the back of my turnout coat, down the back of my pants, and into my boots. It was the most miserable weather experience I've had on a scene. Do I blame him? Yes, still, I blame him. <laughs> But that made it uncomfortable for me, and I kind of jumped a little bit when that rain started going down the back of my neck, which probably wasn't the best thing that I could do for patient care. Right? Probably not. If I had been holding C-spine on that patient, I might have damaged that patient if I had jumped when the water ran down the back of my neck. So we have to think about weather as it relates to patient care as well. Not only scene safety, but patient care. What else do we think about when, we're on the way, when our, we are on our way to a scene? How many patients? Is that important to know whether or not we're going to be safe? Yeah. Do we need extra help? Do we need extra help or extra resources to handle the number of patients we have? What else? Is the scene safe? Like, is it a violent scene or is there like police there to okay. take care of the violence? So, is it a safe scene? 
words that we're going to run across on scene? Uh, fire, hazardous materials. Um, we ran into fugitives. Um, fugitives. Drug, yeah. drug smuggling. Yeah. All kinds of things. What else? A combative uh, patients. Yeah, diabetics and head injuries are my favorite. What else? Um, treacherous terrain, I guess you'd say. Okay, you have crappy terrain. For us, uh, um, traffic. Traffic they is a hazard? They don't slow down and move over. No. You mentioned drugs, but the other thing would be, uh, say if it was a... Uh, um, like a drug lab, alcohol. you run into the issue of uh, intentional booby traps and other things. Okay. I was going to try to figure out how to put that next to drugs, but... Yeah. What else? Unruly family members. Okay, we could have family members that are a problem. Close your eyes for a minute. And I want you to imagine that you are driving to class tonight. And as you're driving to class, you come to this intersection right here at Locust Grove and Eustick. It is a four-way stoplight with basically five lanes in each direction because it's got two directional lanes on both sides and it's got a turn lane in the middle all the way around. As you pull up to this intersection, you watch a vehicle speed through the intersection and T-bone a white Ford pickup on the passenger side. The white Ford pickup gets shoved into a power pole and now you have power lines dangling. You have one patient in the white Ford pickup, you have two patients in the little passenger car, let's call it a Honda, little gray Honda, that plowed into the side of this Ford pickup. What are some of the hazards or the scene safety issues that we see on this scene? You've got the other traffic. You've got the electrical overhang. Okay, we've got power. You've got the mechanical problem of the pole and or whatever was up there falling. We just had a peregrine falcon fall on top of the truck. You're going to have bystanders all over the place because okay. everybody saw it. Vehicle stability. Vehicle stability? The vehicles themselves, yeah. So you've got batteries, you've got gasoline, you've got spilled coolant. Yeah. What else do we have? Are our airbags deployed? Oh, uh, yeah. Do That's our patients need extrication? The one in the Ford, he might be okay, he might be able to get out, but I'll bet that the ones that are in the little Honda, they're going to need extrication. Make guess maybe they could climb on the back seat and out the doors, but, you know. Is there intrusion into the compartments? Do we have glass laying all over the place? Do we have... Sharp steel. Steel. Okay. What are some of the other hazards that we have? We talked about fluids from the vehicle. We talked about the batteries. If one of them happens to be a hybrid, you've got additional problems because those cars all have high voltage electricity in a lot of weird places. A lot of also weird places. Also multiple batteries. Yeah. So when you're pulling up on scene, you can't always just trust what you see. Okay? If you were to look at that Ford pickup and you were to look at that little Honda and you saw that you have this collision, the Honda, you know, T-bone. You guys are going to learn to love my drawings, by the way. That's intrusion right there. How's that? The Honda T-Bone the Ford right over here. Cargo. Okay, do we have cargo in the truck? What is it? Is it fireworks? Maybe, maybe this is a truck for Rocky Mountain fireworks and they're hauling the 4th of July load. Who knows? What else? What other problems might we have? We're in a pretty residential area. Did anybody get hit that wasn't in the, like, 
Right. Hey, oh, yeah. oh, do we have any initial. pedestrians or anybody else who got hit? People that were not in the vehicles. Is there a dog? Maybe there's a dog in the back of this truck and the dog got tossed out. When you pull up on this and you see this little Honda has ran into, has run into this big Ford pickup which pushed it into this power pole, that's what you're going to see. But you got to be thinking about all of this other stuff. Okay? Because you want to go home tonight. Your wives want you to go home tonight. If you have children, significant others, whatever, they want you to go home tonight. So you got to be prepared to think about all this other stuff. How are you going to make sure that you stay safe with all of this crap? Scene size up. Scene size up. Okay. Let's talk about PPE. What kind of PPE is going to help us out here? Gloves. Gloves. BSI scene safe. What? It's a BSI scene safe. BSI scene safe. Yeah. What kind of PPE are we going to have on? For that, turnout 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 preferable. Yeah, we're going to have turnouts on. But at least a jumpsuit. What are we going to have on our feet? Boots of some sort. Boots or steel toes. Something. Yeah, we're at least going to have boots on. And we're talking not just rubber gloves or plastic gloves or nitrile gloves. I keep calling them rubber, but they're not really rubber. Nitrile, latex, whatever. Not just gloves, but we're going to make sure we have good, solid leather gloves on. If we're going to be pulling and prying and moving metal apart, we need to have our hands well protected. What else? Eye protection. Helmet. Eye, eye protection. protection. Helmet. Anything else you can think of? We talked about it a little bit earlier when we talked about... Uh, we already talked about PPE a little bit, and you said the high visibility vests, yeah. right? Are they required out here? No. They're not required by OSHA, but guess who they may be required by? Your local department. Yeah, they might be required by your agency. Okay, <clears throat> so maybe our high vis vests. Uh, some sort of respiratory protection if you're cutting into something. All right. We might need, depending on what we're dealing with, we might need respiratory respiratory protection. Okay. All of these things, sometimes you think they're a pain in the butt, right? But all of these things is designed so that you go home tonight. That you go home with all your limbs, you go home with all your body parts, you know, and you go home safely. So they're important things to have around. Hazardous materials. Report them. Who are you going to report them to? Statecom. Statecom. What is Statecom? A agency that provides um, uh, a special, like yeah, specialized team to respond to the hazmat incident. Their life flight is basically. Yeah, or life flight, or hmm. different specialized people. Right? It's on our radio. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Okay. No, it's just unique. It is very unique. I come from a different world. It's the only completely. it's the only one like it in the country. And people fly in from all over the place. Communications directors from all over the country fly in to look at Statecom as a model. Because it's the only one like it in the entire country. You can reach Statecom from your handheld radio anywhere in the state. Because they've got 27 mountaintop repeaters. Those two frequencies will get you to Statecom to one of their repeaters and you, it'll get you to Statecom here in Meridian. Statecom is actually part of the Bureau of Emergency Medical Services, one of the sections within the Bureau of EMS and Preparedness. It's housed on ISP's campus, which is not too far from here. It's just right off the uh, Meridian exit. Pardon? By the water tower. Yeah, the water kind of tower over by the water tower on the ISP campus. It's right near ISP's uh, training track for their cars. Um, and Statecom still dispatches some rural EMS agencies. They don't do a lot of it, like maybe 15 or 16 rural EMS agencies, but what they specialize in is pulling teams together when they're needed. Okay, so Statecom is your go-to resource for things like hazmat, or if you need a critical incident stress debriefing, Statecom has the information to get you to the CISM team that's local to your region. Uh, 
They have the ability to put you in contact with your regional response team, which is based out at Gowan Field, right? Um, pardon? 101st CSD. Yeah. Uh, the civil support team is also out there. They have the ability to put you in contact with the civil support team. They have the ability to put you in contact with poison control. They can put you in contact with the EMS agency that's on the ground. They can put you in contact with the EMS agency that's in the air. Okay. Statecom is unique. There's only one dispatch center like it in the entire country, and we're lucky enough to have it here. They also do all of the dispatching for the Idaho Transportation Department, ITD. So, if you have a problem on a highway and you need ITD, guess who you call? Statecom. They're responsible for all of the uh, interactive signs that cross the freeway. You know, the ones that say, Amber Alert, blah, 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 or Arrive Alive. Those ones that go right across the freeway. Statecom is responsible for programming all of those. They're responsible for sending out the sanding trucks in the winter. All of that is Statecom's responsibility. If you ever want to take a trip over there just to look around, let me know. I'll hook you up with Michelle Carreras. She's a wonderful lady. She loves to show off her dispatch center. She's been in charge over there for, it's got to be going on 12 or 13 years. She's been instrumental in Statecom becoming what it is. How old is that organization? Pardon? How old is the organization? Uh, well, it was created shortly after the EMS Bureau was created. The EMS Bureau was created in 1977, <coughs> 76, 77, and Dia Gaynor became the EMS Bureau Chief in, 19, in the late 1980s, maybe. And when Dia came in, she thought that Statecom was a necessary thing, and she lobbied for it, and she got it established in the late 1980s. All right, we got 10 minutes. Let's see what we can get through here. Hell yeah. If you have a critically, critically, if you have a critically ill or injured patient, what are you going to do? How are you going to talk to them? How are you going to treat them? With care. With care. Good call. <laughs> it's a great place to start. How are we going to take care of them? You need to come up with a calm demeanor that has got confidence in it. So Fake until you make it? Yes, absolutely. It's likely that your critical patient knows that they are critically ill or injured. Okay? And if you act like it's a huge emergency, it's going to make it even worse. So, you need to let them know that you are doing everything you can to help them. Make sure you treat them with dignity and respect. It's quite common for a critically ill or critically injured patient to respond oddly. I don't normally put the little hashtags on my eyes, but it looks really weird next to my two L's, so. Okay, so they may respond with anxiety. What are some of the cues that you're gonna get that show that they're responding with anxiety? How are you going to know that they're feeling anxious? They may like pull away from you. Okay, they may pull away from you. What do you think that's indicative of? Them pulling away. It's a fear response. It's a fear response. What else? Hostile. They could be hostile. Yeah, defensive. signs. Everything's going to go up. Everything's going to go up, at least to start with, right? One critically injured person that I dealt with was absolutely stone cold calm. And it was weird because I expected differently. And they were just like, do whatever you want to do with me. We're good. Just go ahead. And I'm like, are you okay? <laughs> it was strange, but it did. But it was it just didn't it didn't work out the way I expected it to. Yeah. Okay, so they may experience anxiety. They may experience pain or fear. They may experience anger or hostility.
If they have been sick for a long time, they may be depressed about it. Okay? If you're faced with someone, we're going to go back up one. If you're faced with someone who is hostile to you, what is your responsibility in that situation? Protect yourself. Protect yourself. You might have to leave. What is the easiest way for you to know how to get out the door? Go the way you came in. Go out the way you came in? Maybe. You should always have your exit strategy, 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 what did I say? Exit strategy in sight. Okay? When we do lockdown drills here and they lock us in our rooms and make us figure out how we're going to get our kids out if somebody's in the hallway shooting, I don't have a whole lot of options here. I've got this door, right? Sorry, I'm off camera. You can't see me. I've got this door, but they lock it and they lock us in here. I have golf clubs in there that I'm supposed to beat the shooter with, but, you know. Anyway, they lock us, this door, and they lock us in here. And I've got students over there, and I've got students hiding in these closets. Well, in this closet, I have a window that's seven feet off the ground. Okay? In that closet, I also have a window that's seven feet off the ground. In the back closet, I don't. So I don't want to put any kids in there. Okay? In this closet, I've got a counter. Like, that's like a desk, because this was designed to be a medical reception office. Um, I've got a desk here, so my kids, and then I've got filing cabinets, so my kids can pretty easily get out that window, if they need to. They're going to have to break it out, but if they need to, they can get out. If they fall on the other side and break a leg, at least they're outside. Right? That's my exit strategy. Is it a sucky one? Yeah. Yeah, but is it the only option I have? Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. yeah, as opposed to facing the shooter, darn straight. So I know what my exit strategy is. Every time I walk into my classroom, I know what my options are to get my kids out if I need to. Hopefully it never comes to that, but I know what they are. And every year when we do our drills, we practice the same way so that we're all on the same page and we all know where to go. So I always have my exit strategy in sight. If you come across someone who's been ill long enough that they're depressed about it, really all you can do is be kind to them. You can provide the best care possible, but you're likely not going to change their illness. You don't have the cure for cancer. Maybe you do and you just haven't released it yet. You're part of, you know, major pharmacology and, you know, you're just making big bucks off of drugs. What about dependency? Do you think dependency is a possibility? What do you think they become dependent on? Your presence. They become pre dependent on your presence? What else do they become dependent on? Some people may be dependent on, like, you're the only people they talk to. You could be the only people that they see. Do you think that when we talk about dependency, we're talking only about their ability to rely on other people? Do you think your critically ill patient may have become dependent on medications? Does that change their behavior? Do you need to be aware of that change? Yeah. They may experience guilt. They're leaving their family behind. They could be leaving their family with astronomical medical bills. They're feeling guilty about it, and yet someone called 911 to come and take care of them. But they're feeling guilty about everything that they're leaving behind. If they are feeling guilty about seeking care, it may have led them to a point where they didn't want to call at all. It may have delayed medical treatment because they felt so guilty about it. They could have... Uh, let's see. They could have some mental health problems. This happens a lot when people start to get older. One of the theories, it's a hypothesis actually, is that within about five years of death, a patient's mental status starts to decrease. Okay? When their mental status starts to go, you can figure that they're going to die in about five years. That theory, that hypothesis, is called terminal drop hypothesis. A terminal drop hypothesis. And it just basically says they have reached a point in their lives 
where mentally they just can't keep it together anymore, and that the beginning of that mental degradation leads toward physical degradation. And then we might, they might have problems dealing with unrelated bad news. If they get bad news from someone else, it may affect how they treat you. So how do we deal with all these things? Honesty. What? Honesty. Honesty. Honesty to a certain point. I'm not going to tell this critically ill patient, dude, you're going to die. Okay. Oh, one time at band camp. It wasn't really a band camp. It was at a car accident on Highway, 19, Highway 95 just outside of SSI in Wilder. And you could just about count on every winter at 7 o'clock every January, one morning in January, 7 o'clock in the morning, usually during the week, you're going to have a head-on collision right at night, Highway 95 in Penny Lane. Okay? One winter, head-on collision, we're out there dealing with this patient, getting him out of the car, we got him extricated out of the car, and he was conscious enough to talk to me, but we were setting a helicopter down to take care of him. Okay? And as the helicopter was setting down, he was on the gurney next to my ambulance, and so I reached over, the helicopter was setting down, I reached over and I took the sheet and I went to cover him up with it. He goes, oh my God, am I dying? I, I, I laughed, I shouldn't have laughed, but I laughed. I'm like, no, no, I, the helicopter's coming, I'm just trying to protect you a little bit. But he was convinced he was dying. Okay, so how are we going to handle our techniques for communicating with our critical patient? What are we gonna do? Before you start, did you want to pause it? Um, I think we can get through it in okay. the next three minutes. Let's do it. Okay? Yep. Uh, so, how are we going to communicate with our critical patient? Allow them to still be hopeful. Allow them to what? Be hopeful. Okay. Don't Allow them to be hopeful. Or avoid sad or grim comments. What else? Well, you need to be truthful with them. Okay, you need to be truthful. But it should be tactfully truthful. As truthful as you have to be. Well, yeah, no, not, not giving them false hope, which is to say, don't tell them something that, you know, blowing sunshine does not work. Does not work. No, it doesn't. How about orienting them? Informing them of anything that's happening to them, what you're going to do, or their situation. Yep. Yep. Make sure that they know as much as they can about what's going on. Communicate with them as to what you are doing so that they understand what you're doing, so that they don't think they're dying. <laughs> Ideas for communicating with critical patients? Uh, be like as clear as possible. Don't yeah, we want to be as clear as possible too. Don't use much clear of medical stuff that they don't understand. Yeah, clear, concise, uh, and short. They're gonna have a hard time following long trains of thought, so we need to make sure that we're taking care of it well. Just can you press the red button? Chapter two will be continued.